Welcome to this episode of Let's Be Civil. Today on Let's Be Civil is Rich Patrick. Rich Patrick is Director of Business Development in the Houston office of Nemo and Moore, a geotechnical engineering firm. Rich holds a BS in civil engineering from Texas Tech University and is a registered professional engineer in Texas. He has over 45 years experience in the design of transportation, water, wastewater, and drainage facilities. In his spare time, Rich enjoys cycling and singing. Okay, everybody, um, welcome uh, back to another edition of uh, Let's Be Civil, uh, our podcast about engineering, civil engineering, and all the people that are involved in civil engineering kind of work. And, um, and today, uh, our, our uh, guest today is Rich, and Rich is in Houston, um, where uh, it's extremely hot all the time, right? Isn't, isn't Houston just like somewhat unbearable. How, how long have you lived in Houston? Oh, gosh. Uh, lived here since uh, 1976. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's been, and it's quite interesting because I grew up in the panhandle of Texas where it's really dry. And, of course, here in Houston, our humidity is, is very high. So um, I, even after being here um, 45 years, I'm still not used to it. So when did you um, move from the Panhandle to Houston? Uh, actually, uh, moved uh, from the Panhandle to Dallas in 1971 and lived there for five years and then moved to Houston in 1976 because uh, my wife is a native Houstonian and um, all of her family was in Houston at the time and so um, like a good husband, I did what my wife told me to do. She said, we're moving to Houston. So I said, I clicked my heels and said, yes, ma'am. So you, so you grew up in the panhandle and then how old were you when you moved to Dallas? I graduated from, from Texas Tech in 1971. Uh, so I was 24 years old at the time. Um, I'm 73 now to save, uh, you from doing the math, but, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and when I say you, I'm talking to the students. Sure, yeah. So, um, but anyway, and and I still laugh at myself because, um, in up until 1971, I had never um, seen a freeway. Believe it or not. So when we moved to Dallas. Wow. My very first time on Central Expressway getting on, I stopped on the entrance ramp. So, <laughs> and all the cars were honking at me. It was this country bumpkin right in the middle of the freeway. That, that's, so, anyway, that's kind of funny. That's, that's my wife funny. still teases me about that. So how long did you live in Dallas? We lived in Dallas for five years. I actually okay. lived in Plano. Okay. North of Dallas, I worked for the highway department, uh, TxDOT, Texas Highway Department. So, um, designing freeways as a civil engineer. So, um, then I decided I wanted to try something else. So, we came to Houston and um, started working for a consulting firm, engineering consulting firm. And I worked for several firms since then. And uh, I now work for uh, Nino and Moore, a geotechnical engineering company, um, who has an office here in Houston. Our corporate office is in San Diego. We oh. have a total of 17 offices and about 460 people total with the firm. So we provide uh, geotechnical engineering services, materials testing services, and environmental services. So let me ask you a question, then we'll come back to, 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 the, to the business side of things. Um, uh, you know, back in, I would say, like in the, in the 70s and 80s, people tended to, to, to not move around a whole lot in terms of right. basically moving, but also changing jobs, right? It, you know, if you go back in time, 
people stayed in one place and they had one job for their career. And so you're kind of, you know, and then today it's, it's very different, you know, lots of, lots of moves and lots of careers. So, mm -hmm. so you, you've moved three times, right? It sounds like you've moved three times uh, right. in, in your life. And so how many different jobs have you held during? Oh, golly gee. Um, I've been on just about every side. I've been on the public side and the, and the private side uh, with consultants. So I've probably had, uh, 10 or 12 jobs over the past uh, 40, what, what, almost 50 years, I guess, uh, 49 years. So, so you're, you're, you actually, um, you're kind of, you you know, sort of in this in between. <laughs> you know? right. mm -hmm. uh, so the timing kind of, kind of fits. And I, I bring that up because just, you know, um, people don't realize that, that, we do change jobs as you know, and, and that there are different opportunities um, out there that, that, you know, a lot of civil engineers just don't, you know, take one position and they're in it for their entire career. I mean, it's not that's that that doesn't happen, um, right. uh, but, but we do make some changes. So um, what's a geotechnical engineer? You know, when you mentioned that you do geotechnical stuff, what, what does that mean? Right. A uh, geotechnical engineer is one who, um, does uh, drilling, obtains uh, soil samples uh, from uh, the ground and determines the soil characteristics uh, of that soil so that he, the geotechnical engineer, can make the proper recommendation to the um, civil engineer or the structural engineer who's designing the facility um, on, on how he needs to design that facility. In other words, the, maybe the slab foundation or the uh, bridge piles that support the bridge um, or the piers that would support the building. Um, we are usually a sub-consultant to a civil engineer that's designing a 50-story skyscraper downtown or a bridge um, over a waterway um, or um, a uh, street, uh, a large uh, wastewater treatment plant, all kinds of things like that. So, so basically everything sits on the ground. I mean, you know, right. the, so ultimately the ground has to support everything. And, and what you That's do right. is you make sure that the person designing a, a facility knows how much force, how much pressure can be put on the ground. So we don't need another leaning tower of Pisa, right? We don't. That's right. <laughs> That's exactly right. 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 And in the report that we prepare, the geotechnical report that we prepare, um, uh, the purpose is to uh, provide that uh, designer or civil engineer with the uh, appropriate recommendations um, for for his design. How thick should he make his slab? Uh, or how much steel should he put in the concrete? Uh, because uh, soils vary, you know, right. like for instance here in Houston we have a lot of clay and in Austin uh, there's a lot of rock. So um, the geotechnical engineer is very critical component of the design of that particular facility. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, the, so if we comment on the Leaning Tower of Pisa a little bit, uh, that that's a that's a Leaning Tower because the that that geotechnical side of things, which they may have you know didn't really necessarily realize, mm -hmm. uh, you know all the all the specifics, but the the soil conditions are different across the width of that that tower, isn't that correct? The, or or the, the, the foundation work was not consistent with the soil conditions? Probably so, that's, that, okay. that's a good uh, research uh, okay. question for me. I need to look into that. I've never really <laughs> actually looked you into it. You just know it tips over you. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. So, so, so I, I, hopefully you can answer this one for me. Lived in Chicago or outside of Chicago and uh, you know, so you mentioned tall buildings. There's, air, you know, it's it's built up just like a Houston is built up or other big city. And someone comes in and decides they want to build a tall building right in the middle of downtown, and they dig a hole in the ground, and there are all these buildings that surround it. It's like how how does how do the surrounding buildings not collapse into the hole 
that oh, yeah. that oh, yeah. uh, that the that is made to put the you know either the the parking deck that goes under the building or just you know whatever structures under the building. I look at that and go, how do how does the other stuff surrounding it just not collapse in? Right. Uh, I think two primary reasons. One is because the uh, previous geotechnical engineer who uh, did the investigation for the existing buildings that are around it uh, recommended that that the piles uh, underneath the building uh, need, need to be uh, so deep and, and so big, uh, depending on the soil characteristics underneath the, that building. And that's what allows that building to stay um, straight up and down. So, so the building's not um, actually being supported by that soil. It's actually rock oh no. further down, right? right? Oh yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, it's 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 uh, supported by piles anywhere from, uh, golly, uh, probably very a smaller building, maybe fifty feet, but the larger uh, fifty to sixty story buildings, um, I think, are one hundred and fifty to two hundred feet deep piles uh, embedded into the ground. Um, so to to help support. You know, and, and also not only the the depth, but and the size, but the number of piles. Um, so there's a lot of um, variances there that that help support the existing buildings. Right. So the soil that you see in that big hole is really kind of just sitting there. It it's well, not actually supporting yeah, the structure. That's right. It's it's sitting there, but um, there are. Uh, sheet pile uh, supports all the way around that right. hole to keep the hole from caving in on the workers, you know, that right. are down right. in the hole working. So, right, right, um, right. So, yeah. so you're, you're a geotechnical engineer, but that's not your day-to-day -day work, correct? Actually, I'm not a geotechnical oh. engineer. Uh, I'm a civil engineer. Civil engineer. I'm a red Yes, I'm a civil engineer. Uh, have a bachelor of science degree from uh, in civil engineering from Texas Tech, uh, and I'm a registered PE professional engineer in the state of Texas. But I'm not a geotechnical okay, okay. engineer. But uh, that's the value of this white hair. I'm old <laughs> enough uh, to, to know what a geotechnical engineer right. generally does. That's right. Right. Uh, can't speak in technicalities like a real ge geotechnical engineer. Right good but right. I know enough to, uh, <laughs> to be make my way around <laughs> yeah so, so so tell us a bit about then your role uh, in the okay oh uh, gosh that there's a lot going on <laughs> um, my role in the company my title is a uh, director of business development uh, within the Houston office each one of our offices uh, has a uh, um, similar person to me and then we have a corporate um, business development manager uh, director but uh, my typical day golly gee is is uh, pretty much different every day that's one of the reasons I really like my job um, uh, I'm able to um, do a lot of different types of things uh, first of all I would start off by um, saying that uh, a lot of our work is from the public side and the private side. Uh, we have a lot of clients who are private uh, land developers, uh, multifamily developers, apartment developers, commercial developers, uh, and but we also have a lot of clients who are public clients like uh, cities and counties, um, uh, airports and ports, um, golly, uh, school districts, um, higher education like uh, Texas State University, um, Texas A&M, Texas Tech. Um, but my typical day, my, my, my basic purpose uh, of being here is to find more projects for the company. Um, and I do that in a lot of different ways. Um, one way is to um, obviously get to know the clients uh, because the um, bread and butter of business development, I would say, is uh, relationships. Um, and 
that's why you, I guess you see a lot of older folks like me who are in business development because I was uh, an actual practicing engineer for probably 30 years, uh, actually designing uh, streets and utilities. And um, uh, the last 20 years, I've been more on the business development side. So I created a lot of relationships with clients, both public and private, during that 30 years um, that I have uh, nurtured during the uh, past several years. And um, the, so, so a typical day is, is to stay in touch with all of my clients, um, uh, try to call most of them, Golly, got so many clients, uh, try to keep in touch with uh, all of them uh, at least every three or four months, uh, some by email, some by phone call. Um, I go to a lot of um, what I call organizational meetings. Um, some of them are professional engineering organizations like ASCE. Um, I'm active or was active previously in the Houston branch of ASCE, um, was president of the branch in 1994, um, and I've been active at the section level, which is the state level, uh, during the past several years, um, and try to also, uh, uh, a prominent thing that I do um, is attend a lot of the um, economic development councils. Um, each little city and large city here in the Houston area has an economic development council uh, where they meet uh, once a month and their whole purpose is kind of like a chamber of commerce to uh, bring in uh, new businesses to the community. And so I, uh, as well as several other engineers, use that as a uh, um, vehicle to meet people. You know, I meet uh, bankers and developers and architects and other civil engineers uh, who will be our clients. Um, and another thing I do typically uh, is attend a lot of the board meetings for a lot of the public agencies like city councils, um, county commissioners courts, um, uh, school district board meetings, um, water authorities like the uh, North Harris County Regional Water Authority. Uh, and each one of those boards has five to nine uh, commissioners or council members or board members and it uh, behooves me to get to know each one of those uh, county commissioners because those are the decision makers on where the projects are going to be assigned. So you're, so, so you're going to these events and, and meeting these people so that when they have a, a, a project and a need for services that, that you guys provide. Um, are they able to say they want your company to do this work or do you have to be into a bidding process or, you know, so, so what, what, is, what is it that you want to get out of attending those events and meeting these people? The main thing I want to get out of uh, attending those um, meetings is number one, uh, um, find out about the projects coming up. Uh, it, it is on me to learn about uh, the CIPs, the capital improvement plans of the cities and the counties to know what types of projects and the value of the projects they have coming up. Um, and, it, and it also is important for me to know um, the, uh, how those projects are going to be paid for, make sure that the, those cities and counties have the money to uh, pay for those projects and to pay for the professional engineering services. And the way we do that is to uh, each one of those agencies 
um, uh, sells bonds. Before they sell bonds, though, they have to have the public approve uh, a bond issue, uh, like a, a $300 million bond issue that they will have either in May or November. So I need to know about that. But uh, uh, I'm glad you asked the question about the uh, uh, how we um, procure the work. Uh, and But no, it's not by bidding. It's against uh, the law, against Texas law for a professional engineer to uh, bid uh, dollar-wise uh, on a project. Engineers are selected only based on qualifications. Um, and so that's why all the agencies put out RFQs. They publish an RFQ, which is a request for qualifications. Right. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, when an agency will publish the RFQ for a particular project, either for a building or for a wastewater treatment plant, um, probably 30 to 40 professional engineering firms will respond to that RFQ. And then the agency will go through an evaluation process where they might uh, uh, determine who the top three qualified firms are and they will invite those firms in for interviews and they'll end up selecting one of those firms and then they will ne negotiate the actual fee. Uh, so, so you're meeting with people. Uh, so going to the meetings helps you become aware that projects are, are on the horizon. Uh, but also meeting the people allows you the opportunity to tell them about the company and the company's background right. and, and history and skill sets and things. And, mm -hmm. and essentially, you're sort of giving them a, a preliminary view of your qualifications. So when they exactly see right. your, your response to the request, they're going, oh, I know that company and they, and you know, and this is their history, right? So, so you're, That's you're, you're right. sort of paving the way, right? For, for right. others. Okay. That's okay. right. So, That's so right. That's right. what goes into, the, what goes into a request for qualifications? Uh, I guess, so what you're saying is that happens for any any kind of work, there it's you're going to see those requests. So let me ask you this first: How do you become aware that the request has been put out to the public? Uh, uh, either by uh, hearing directly from the county commissioner or the. Or a lot of times, all those agencies will also have an engineer. I mean, they'll have a county engineer or a city engineer um, or a consulting engineer who's representing that particular board. And so through my relationship with, with that engineer, I will learn about uh, okay. uh, projects coming up. But, but, but really, the, the way we learn about the, the actual RFQ when it's actually put out on the street is, is when it's published. Uh, there are um, uh, companies or processes uh, that collect all of the RFQs that are published and send notices of those RFQs to all the consulting engineers. And then it's kind of like a menu at a, at a restaurant. Then you can go down and look at all the RFQs and say, oh gosh, yeah, I, I want to uh, look into this one or pursue this one or that one. And, and then uh, usually RFQs are, um, when you submit them, they're probably 20 to 30 pages, and the material that goes into the RFQs uh, is the list of projects that you've done previously that are similar, uh, resumes of uh, folks in your firm, you know, that show their qualifications, um, and insurance. Um, the, the agency wants to make sure that the engineering company has a proper professional insurance, um, there's... So is it kind of like a resume for the company? Right, right. Mm -hmm. So it, right. It, it, it's showing that you're capable of doing the work, you have the resources to complete the job. That's right. right. That's right. And a lot of them ask, well, how would you complete this project? You know, what what is your uh, organizational plan? Uh, how do you propose to do this? Or what are your um, safety requirements and, and that kind of thing. So um, 
you know, they want to see how professional the company is and if they've done this before. Right, right. So what's the success, what's the success rate on, on RFQs? You know, so it's sounding to me like as a, as a university professor, you know, we submit right. proposals for research, you know, and, and, mm. and, you know, there's a percentage mm. and it's not a very high number um, where you're successful That's in good. getting that. But so, uh, I would say just, uh, I, I guess we should keep better track of it, but uh, I personally uh, am, am not uh, totally aware of our uh, percent uh, win, but I would say it's probably in the, gosh, we go after so many of them, I would say it varies from 15 to 25%, maybe okay. something okay. like that. Okay, which isn't bad. Uh, and, I mean, if every one of that, every four or so. Yeah, yeah, and and primarily the 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 percentage is higher when we choose not to go after every single one of them, you know, um, because if, if you just uh, find out about the RFQ when it's published, nine times out of ten you're too late. Gotcha. Um, yeah, you don't have time to to put stuff together for the project. Is that right. yeah right? Because usually the agencies will give you a two to three week uh, time period uh, to prepare it. When it's first advertised, it'll be advertised two to three times. And when it's very first advertised uh, to be submitted three weeks later, it'll uh, say that you have the next week uh, to ask questions. You can you can email questions into them, um, but you are not to contact any of the uh, staff or or the uh, board members on the board and uh, things like that gotcha, so gotcha. Uh, gotcha. but anyway it, it's an interesting uh, process so so before we talk about uh, some uh, a different uh, uh, topic what's what give me a if it's the largest dollar amount or the biggest facility or, you know, however you might want to uh, uh, respond to this, what was, what's the most interesting project that you uh, were able to help secure through, through your efforts? Oh, okay. Oh, golly gee whiz. Um, there's been a lot of different projects. Um, uh, so what stands I, out to you? It's like, man, that, that one was, I'm, I'm glad we got that one. It was really a cool, for whatever reason. Is there any, anything that just pops into your head? Uh, yes, the, the one, if, if I can talk about one that was uh, probably 30 years ago, one, oh, yeah. of the most, one of the most interesting ones was uh, uh, actually uh, politically based and, and it was, uh, a, a project that was in a small town that was uh, within the, the larger, uh, within a county, and it was a, a small two-lane roadway um, that uh, was going through a little city, but the roadway itself was actually on the county road log, and uh, the county hired us to widen it to uh, four lanes and it was an existing two lane and the little city that it went through uh, had a lot of very wealthy people in there and they didn't want it widened to uh, four four lanes and so the mayor of the when i sent my survey crew out to take cross sections the mayor of the small city uh sent her policeman out to arrest my survey crew <laughs> so uh, so i called the county engineer and he sent the county sheriff's deputies out to uh, do a verbal battle with the city policeman. And so <laughs> it was it was f funny now that I can look back at it and I would stand back and say, I just want to do the engineering. You guys don't want the guns at me. So um, anyway. Yeah, we, we probably wouldn't be able to recruit too many students for to be civil engineers if they were going to have to deal with something like that on a regular yeah. basis. Yeah, no, well, I guess I shouldn't have said that. No, no, so. no, no. It, 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 no, because, I mean, things happen, you know. Um, yeah. So we were talking earlier, and um, you're into cycling. Um, right. In my younger days, I, I uh, rode a bike. Um, 
I haven't ridden one much, uh, in, you know, as the years have gone by. But I do enjoy right. watching the Tour de France. I'm, I'm disappointed mm -hmm. that this year it's, it's delayed. I hope that it doesn't get canceled. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, but but I, I, I love watching those races. I'm sure that there are a lot of people that, that, that look at those kind of events and say, why do you watch people ride a bike? <laughs> it's, right. but, but there's strategy and things, but, but you are, mm -hmm. you're, you're a bike rider. You, you are, you are a, a, a long distance. You've ridden some long distance bike rides. So That's correct. tell us a little bit about your bike riding background. Oh, okay, good. I appreciate that. Uh, I started in uh, 2007 uh, and uh, I still ride the bike 20 to 30 miles a week, but uh, I started uh, in 2007 riding on the MS-150, which was a 150-mile bike ride over two days from uh, Houston to Austin. And the primary reason I did it is because my wife, uh, Margie, has MS, and this is a fundraising event to help uh, raise funds to find a cure for MS. So um, I was excited to do that. And um, when we signed up for the MS-150, we made the commitment to raise at least $400. Uh, but I was able to raise twelve, sometimes $16,000 a year. And, and because of that, um, I was able to um, raise enough money to qualify to be in the Houston um, MS Society Hall of Fame fundraising yeah. Hall of Fame. So I'm uh, proud of that. Uh, so I'll brag a little bit about that, I guess. But yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, excellent. The, the neatest moment, though, uh, when we came into Austin on the second day, it was always on a Saturday and a Sunday was uh, when I rounded the corner and coming down Congress Avenue and I could see the state capitol in the background and my wife was on the right hand side underneath the MS tent and uh, there was never a dry eye. It was very emotional. So it's not a competitive ride, no. is it? it? It's just no. a, a it's, it's a yeah. casual. Right. It's a, yeah, you're just really riding for the for the fundraising aspect. That's right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So, so what kind Perfect. of bike do you yeah. ride? Uh, it's, it's a, it's a road bike. It's a giant, uh, okay. is the brand. Right. Um, and it's got like 27 gears on it. So, um, you know, for going up the hill and down the hill, and right. the fastest I ever went was just like 39 miles an hour. And I think the guys on the Tour de France go 55 miles yeah. an hour sometimes yeah. Yeah. coming yeah. down those mountains. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Anyway. So big so is, is is the is the course that you the path that you follow fairly flat? I mean, they they don't want people dropping off the back or dropping out of the two days because you're on some steep steep incline or or, or you know. So so what's the terrain like for for there? There were days? some pretty good hills. We would go through the the uh, parks near Bastrop a lot of times, um, and there were a lot of hills that were three to five percent gradient, I okay. guess. And as you know, on the Tour de France, there's 10% gradient yeah. is, is some of those mountains. But um, some of the parks, uh, some of the hills in the parks in Bastrop uh, were pretty steep. And uh, uh, I'd have to go down to the lowest gear to be able to uh, get up those um, hills. But um, it was pretty challenging. Uh, for especially for an old guy like me, so <laughs> so we're, so we're we're actually a little bit over time here, which is not a not a big deal. But tell me a little bit about your weekly ride. So you said you, you do uh, you know twenty ish you know or so miles a week. So you know yes. where do you ride when you're when you're just out, out cruising? Uh, I ride along the George Bush Trail here in Houston uh, from Katy going east uh, to the Beltway which is along Buffalo Bayou, and it's probably um, 15 miles one way. So if I go all the way to the Beltway and back, it's 35 miles total. Um, but uh, yes, it's pretty flat. Uh, How long does it take you? It takes uh, probably three hours to do the 35 uh, miles for me because I'll go, especially in the heat and humidity here in Houston, I'll go for an hour 
and then they have benches along the way underneath a nice shade tree you oh, can okay. stop okay. And, and drink some water and eat a protein bar and um uh, you know um take a bit but i try not to stop more than five or six or seven minutes because as old as i am my uh, muscles start to tighten up you know <laughs> so uh, it's loose again so well, this has been this has been an excellent conversation. I, I really enjoy it. That's one of the things about uh, these podcasts is I get to talk to a lot of different people and and learn things, um, uh, and and it's just fun and it goes by so fast. So, uh, I, re John. I really appreciate your time uh, and Thank your you. insights in, into the kind of work that you do as a as a business developer. And and maybe we'll be you, you're in Houston and I'll be up here. Uh, uh, in the San Marcos area, and, and maybe we'll be watching the Tour de France at the same time. I'll have to text you, right. you know, what you think about uh, what's going on in the race. So, all right, all right. So you Sounds have a good, good you have a good rest of the day. I appreciate your time okay. greatly.